Over the course of human civilization, the rise and fall of great empires has been connected to the soil. Why do some people have less food and others more? Welcome again. Today we outline the issues involved in the imbalance in global food supply. And we compare and contrast the efficiency of terrestrial and aquatic food production systems. In many cases, the imbalance in food supply has simply to do with the size of the proverbial pie, with the pie representing the resources available. For some countries, like the United States, there is an abundance of available food when compared to the population size, while for others, like Bangladesh, the population is almost the same as the United States, but the size of the pie is significantly smaller. But this is not to say that all densely populated countries have small shares of global food production. Some of the smallest countries on Earth, like Singapore and Monaco, are among the wealthiest places in the world. Loess, a sedimentary soil formed from glacier movement and wind action. The most fertile soil on planet Earth. It is no coincidence that the richest deposit of Loess is found in the most powerful nation on Earth. The so-called breadbasket of the planet is built on a foundation of this rich and productive soil. Many countries with less productive soils also have access to abundant food resources. The rainforest is an excellent source of food and in some areas it is being cleared for cattle ranching. The soil itself is quite poor. But the abundant rainfall, the high levels of insulation or sunshine, and the warm temperatures allow for high levels of productivity. In some countries, convenient access to a warm and productive ocean is an excellent source of food. Some with poorer soils are blessed with an abundance of wealth to irrigate the soils and to use mechanization and to distribute the food with a large network of roads. Still others are cursed with a lack of rainfall, a desert climate, and torn apart by war. While some with an abundance of natural resources like oil and with the right political climate enjoy great prosperity and they can afford to bring food to their shores in large amounts. Still others with an abundance of rainfall and sunshine find themselves short of food because of the cycle of poverty. They have degraded their soils and deforested their environment. The reason why some have more food than others is not simply due to the soil, but it's related to climate, to socio-political conditions, like the presence of war and the wealth of the country and its level of economic prosperity and the amount of international trade with other nations. As we reflect on this imbalance, it is useful to think about where can we get the most efficient supply of food from the aquatic environment or from the terrestrial environment. The ocean, which makes up 70% of the planet's surface, has the potential to produce vast amounts of food. Let's consider the efficiency of each of these methods of food production. The terrestrial system versus producing it from the aquatic system. The inputs into any food production system include water, temperature, nutrients, and light for photosynthesis in the primary producers. The primary producers in turn feed secondary 
productivity or primary consumers. Food is then passed along the food chain to higher trophic levels. These energy transfers are subject to losses at each level. This in keeping with the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy. How does an aquatic system compare to a terrestrial system with respect to this energy transfer process? Aquatic systems are subject to large amounts of light being reflected off the surface of water. As you can see in this image, a large amount of light is reflected and then the amount of light that can penetrate down below the surface to be used by primary producers is limited. Many aquatic food chains involve tiny microorganisms as primary consumers. It takes several energy transfers before arriving at the level of production required for producing human food. In this simple food chain, you can see the phytoplankton being consumed by the tiny zooplankton, which are in turn eaten by small fish, which are then eaten by the larger fish, which would be the source of food for humans. Five links in this food chain before salmon arrives on the dinner table. The food that we get from the aquatic environment, the ocean, and a few large lakes. This food, for the most part, comes from fairly high up on this transfer chain, with very little being taken at the primary productivity level, or even the secondary level. And most of the food that comes out of the ocean to feed mankind comes from the higher feeding levels. And after the light from the sun and the energy that it provides has been dissipated through several energy losses at each trophic level. Terrestrial food chains are certainly subject to the same energy losses. In fact, the extent of the losses in the terrestrial environment are even greater. But due to human taste, most of the resources that we consume from the terrestrial environment are taken directly from primary productivity and if not from secondary productivity. Corn and wheat are the results of primary production. And even when the corn is used to feed these chickens, humans find themselves as secondary consumers with not as many links in this chain as you would find in the aquatic environment.